All right, welcome. Thanks for joining us today. My name is Drew Ketchum. I am the family pastor down at the Green Campus. And today I'm continuing our series, uh, The Hall of Faith, where we're looking at the men and women written about in Hebrews 11. And today I have the pleasure of talking about Gideon. And we find Gideon in verse 32. And it says, And what more shall I say? I do not have time to tell about Gideon, Barak, Samson, and Jephthah, about David and Samuel and the prophets who through faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice, and gained what was promised, who shut the mouths of lions, quenched the fury of the flames, and escaped the edge of the sword, whose weakness was turned to strength, and who became powerful in battle and routed foreign armies. I feel bad for Gideon, man. Abraham gets, he gets three paragraphs. Moses gets two. And Gideon, he has to share a sentence. And it's, I mean, it's a long sentence, but he has to share a sentence with five other guys. But I love the story of Gideon. Because the story of Gideon is about a lot of things, but it's also about underdogs. And I'm, I'm all about the underdog, right? I grew up in Washington. I'm a Seattle sports fan. All I know is what it is to cheer for an underdog. Even when they're good, they're the underdogs, right? That's all I know. And so I wanted to know, what is the greatest underdog story in non-biblical military history? And so I set out to find that. And what I found was this, the Battle of Murray. And it takes place September 12, 1213. And the Battle of Murray uh, starts with the French crusaders led by Simon de Montfort. And they're tasked with defending this recently reclaimed city uh, from an approaching Spanish army. And this is a monumental task, all right? Because this Spanish army drastically outnumbers the French. They're led by King Peter II and Count Raymond VI. And these guys, you know, they're the real deal because they have numbers in their names, right? And they lead an army that is comprised of about 30,000 infantrymen. And then they have another 2,000 cavalry on top of that. And that 2,000 cavalry outnumbers the entirety of the French forces because they're about 1,600 strong. They, got, they have 700 infantrymen and they got about 900 cavalry. They're outnumbered 25 to 1. And I look at the numbers and I'm like, this, this, this is impossible. There's no way the French have a chance. And yet what we see is at the end of the day, at the end of the battle, they have a huge victory. There are 20,000 Spanish men lying dead. And for the French, eight. And I'm like, this is, this is, um, how do you not even get to double digits, right? This is, you had 32,000 men and you can't even do that on accident? It doesn't make sense to me. So I'm like, well, how, how does this happen? And so I set out to read about it. And what I found is it's apparent how this could happen. You see the French, they're led by Simon, and he is a tactical genius, right? Tactical genius. He looks at his army and he says, yeah, we may be better equipped, Uh, we may be better prepared, right? The the historians look back at these, these knights that comprise the French crusaders and they're like, these are the tanks of the time. These are the best of the best. And he looks at all that and he says, no, that's not enough. They got 32,000, we got 16, I gotta do something more. And so, He comes up with this great plan. He takes the 700 infantrymen and he parks them at the gate of the city. And he says, you're going to stand here. And when those 32,000 men come down crashing at you, you're going to hold the line. And my cavalry, our 900 cavalry, I'm going to send them out the back. We're going to go out through the countryside. We're going to divide into three units. And when that army comes, we're going to spring from every side. We're going to flank them. And we're going to trap them right where we want them. And Simon's counterpart, King Peter, he's no tactical genius Maybe a tactical imbecile, right? He looks at his 32,000 men and the tiny army he's up against, and he doesn't worry about how he's going to put his men in the best position. He's thinking about anything but that. He's thinking about his victory parade back home. He's thinking, yeah, right, he's got his Instagram, he's putting together his Instagram post, selfie with hashtag, going to be a bloodbath, baby. He's thinking of his, the pose he's going to have in the town later and what it's going to look like. It's double finger guns, by the way. He's thinking about anything but the oncoming battle. And, and he has some wise counsel too. His brother-in-law, Count Raymond, he says, you know, these French guys are for real. Maybe we should lob some arrows at them. You know, soften them up a little bit. And King Peter's response is, that's too unknightly. That's dishonorable. And yet, it's not too dishonorable or too unknightly for him to ride at the front of his army without, army, without any armor on so that he can have the best view possible of his victory. And the battle unfolds, and the French plan plays out perfectly. 
The Spaniards crash into the city gate and the 700 men, and they're stopped dead in their tracks. And King Peter yells out at the top of his lungs, I'm the king! I'm the king! And his army's eyes all go to him, and they watch as he's cut down in front of them. And the Spanish panic, and they flee right into the waiting trap of the 900 cavalry, and they're cut down by the tens of thousands. When we look at this army, we can, or this, this battle, we can see how it's possible that an, an army outnumbered 25 to 1 can have success. And my mind goes to, how is this, where would this become impossible? At what point? At 50 to 1? At 100 to 1? What if an army was outnumbered 450 to 1? Would it be possible then? And today that's exactly what we're going to look at. We're going to look at how Gideon is transformed into a man who is terrified into a man who is going to lead God's army outnumbered 450 to 1 and be successful. And we're going to go ahead and I want you to turn uh, to Judges 6. We're going to be in Judges 6 today. And it's here we first find Gideon. It says the angel of the Lord came and sat down under the oak in Ophrah that belonged to Joash the Abirazite where his son Gideon was threshing wheat in a wine press to keep it from the Midianites. And we're going to pause here really quick. I, I'm going to, we're going to focus on the angel of the Lord here for a second because I'm going, to, I'm going to use it a little bit interchangeably. I'm going to say angel of the Lord. I'm going to say Lord. I'm going to say God uh, because the most agreed upon thing is this is actually Jesus in the Old Testament. So when I start referring to it as God, that's why I'm doing that. And uh, we're, going to look at what, <clears throat> we're going to look at how Gideon is terrified, right? He's threshing wine in a wine press, or wheat in a wine press because he is terrified in the Midi- of the Midianites. And we look back, and it's very apparent why that's true. You see, what has happened is God's people, the Israelites, they have turned away from God. Despite all he's done for them, they've decided, you know what, we're not going to follow you anymore, God. We like this God Baal. We like this God Asherah. We're going to follow them. And God says, all right, I'm going to turn you over to your sin. I'm going to turn you over to the Midianites the provision and protection that I've provided, I'm not going to do that anymore. Not why you turn your back on me. And the Midianites have the Israelites under their thumb. See, every year they come crashing through the countryside. They steal their, their food. They kill their animals. They chase the Israelites to where they're mostly living in caves at this point. And it's here we find a terrified Gideon threshing wheat in a wine press. And I know we live in a rural area, we know quite a bit about farming, but I don't see a lot of uh, wheat being processed here. So we're going to look at that real quick. And this is a, what would be an Old Testament threshing floor, right? And there's some qualities about it that make it really good. If you notice, it's out in the open, right? And what you would do is you would spread the wheat out really nice and, and thin on the ground. And then you would go around and you would stomp on it. And if you were well off, you might have what's called a threshing board. And you would pull that behind it. It would do the work for you. Or you would have a donkey to even do that part for you. But the, the important part about it being out in the open is after that's all done, you take it and you toss the wheat up into the air. And the wind would do a lot of the work for you. See, it would separate the chaff and you leave the usable grain. And we find Gideon doing this work in a wine press. It's dark. It's confined. And most importantly, there is no wind. See, he is willing to do anything possible to hide the simple act of gathering grain from the Midianites so they won't come and take it from him. He is terrified, and rightfully so. And it's this man that God is going to transform into the leader of his army. And he's going to go about it first. He's going to prep Gideon's heart because this man is not ready to lead it. And he's going to go about it in multiple ways. And we're going to look at those. First one that we're going to look at is how he points Gideon from himself back to God. See, Gideon uh, comes out of the wine press, and the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon, and he says, The Lord is with you, mighty warrior. And I can just imagine Gideon, right? He comes out, and he's like, Oh, me. There's nobody else. You must be talking to me. <laughs> no, that's not true. And he's going to refute that. He's going to tell this guy, you're out of your mind. This is not true. First thing he's going to go, he said, pardon me, my Lord, but if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? Where are all his wonders that our ancestors told us about when they said, did not the Lord bring us up out of Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and given us into the hand of Midian. Gideon hears that statement and he thinks, are you crazy? I've heard about God. 
right? I've heard about all his miracles. I heard about the plagues. I heard about the pillars of smoke and fire and the parting of the Red Sea and the manna raining from heaven. I'd heard about the walls of Jericho. I've heard about all these amazing things. I don't see any of that. So he may be with somebody. God may be with somebody, but he's certainly not with me. I think a lot of times we look at Gideon and we think, how foolish can you be? And yet what I often find of of myself even is I look and I'm like, God, where's my big miracle? And Gideon was about 200 years from all the miracles he was looking back to. And so when I look to myself and say, where's the big miracle? I'm no more, not much different than Gideon. This is not the, the rule is the big miracles. The rule or the big miracles are the exceptions. And God's going to go ahead and he's going to tell Gideon, you're going to go ahead and you're going to conquer the Midianites. I'm going to send you to do that. And again, Gideon says, pardon me, my Lord, but how can I save Israel? My clan is the weakest of Manasseh and I am the least in my family. Gideon hears what God says he's capable of accomplishing. He says, "Mm mm-mm, not me. There's plenty of people who may be able to accomplish that, but not me. Maybe you look at my family, my clan, my tribe, all of Israel. You'll find somebody, but it's not me. He's going to tell God exactly who he is and who he isn't. When I was a, when I was a teenager, <clears throat> I would often in the summer go to work with my dad, right? He was a firefighter, but in the summer he would do uh, uh, construction on the side. And every summer I'd go just to be with him and earn extra money. And I remember one day my dad comes to me and he says, Hey, Drew, uh, my buddy Steve, we're going to go pour concrete slab for him. And uh, we just need an extra guy, so would you come and help with that? And I looked at my dad and thought, Yeah, I don't really know how to pour concrete. And my dad He's a patient man. He's very kind. He just thought, yeah, Drew, I, I, I am aware of that, right? I've been, you know, I'm the one who taught you to hammer a nail and uh, <clears throat> frame and hang sheetrock. I'm the one who told you, taught you how to change the oil and replace the radiator. Like, there is no construction that you have ever done in your life that I haven't been present. I'm pretty aware. I didn't ask you to come because of your concrete pouring skills. I just wanted you to join me. And I wanted to teach you. I think I, how ridiculous I was to tell my dad he had no idea that I couldn't pour concrete and how ridiculous Gideon is to say, yeah, I'm not really that kind of guy. I'm not really a warrior, God. As if God didn't know. Gideon was missing the point. God wasn't asking him because he was a great warrior in the moment. He just wanted him to join him in what he was going to accomplish. Excuse me. See, Gideon, he looked at what God was calling him to, and he looked at himself and he said, yeah, I don't really see that. I'm doing all the math. I'm, I lack faith. I'm no warrior. I'm, I'm terrified. I'm alone. There's a t- huge army. And when you add all those together, they don't equal success, God. Your math is a mess. And God says, I will be with you. And you will strike down all the Midianites, leaving none alive. God said, yeah, you're right. When you do the math with just yourself, yeah, you're not getting success. But you missed the key ingredient. You missed the one part that you left out. It's that I'm going to be with you and you can take all the qualities you do or don't have and add them together. But then you add me. And that's where we're going to guaranteed success. God, our Gideon hears all this, and he's like, all right, I, I hear what you're saying, God, and maybe I can believe all this, uh, but he needs some more, right? And God's going to continue prepping his heart, transforming him, and God is going to go ahead and show uh, Gideon some patience. <clears throat> See, Gideon is going to go ahead and say, you know, I really need something more. I really need to know you are who you say. I need you to tell me and show me that you are actually capable of accomplishing the impossible, So here's what I need from you, God. I need you to wait here. I'm going to go ahead. I'm going to go gather up the sacrifice. I'm going to bring it back. And then I need your miracle. And at this point, I'm like, oh, Gideon, you done messed up, right? Because when I grew up, I learned a lot about God. And what I learned was a, a flawed version of him. He's an angry, wrathful, jealous God, and he has no time for any of Gideon's nonsense. So every time, even today, I get to this part of the story, and I'm like, oh, Gideon, God is going to smite you right there. 
and yet what we see from God is love and patience. And his response is, I will wait until you return. And Gideon goes and he gathers the sacrifice and he brings it back and God says to set it down on the rock and here is going to be your sign. It says the angel of the Lord touched the meat and the unleavened bread with the tip of the staff that was in his hand. Fire flared from the rock, consuming the meat and the bread. God's going to give him his miracle, his sign. He's going to break the law of physics, right? I, uh, and in college, uh, right out of high school, I wanted more than anything to be like my dad. And so I went to school uh, for fire service, and there I learned fire science. And we have, uh, humans, we have a pretty good idea about how fire works. We don't have everything figured out, but we got that, right? And there's three main things that make a fire. First one, oxygen, is there. Uh, but there's two other things. There's fuel, right? And I think we all understand this idea. When we want to go build a fire, we gather up wood. We don't gather up rocks because rocks don't really burn, right? And then there's a second part. Uh, we need an ignition source, a uh, heat, right? We usually lose flame. We have a lighter. Well, let's go ahead and look at uh, how he's going to do it. He's going to use, <clears throat> he says, the angel of the Lord touched the meat and the unleavened bread with the tip of the staff that was in his hand. Fire flared from the rock, consuming the meat and the bread. He's going to use rock as his fuel, and he's going to use a staff, most likely made of wood, which, I mean, would have done a great job for the fuel part, but not really great for starting a fire, because we, we do know that spontaneous combustion is not real. Uh, he gives him his sign, and he gives him his miracle. And then he, he does his mic drop, right, because it says the angel of the Lord disappeared. Gideon continues to be transformed, prepped his heart towards God, and yet, unfortunately, it's still not enough. And God's going to continue to do this work. And he's going to go ahead and he's going to show him a little bit of success. He's going to show him how he's actually in the moment going to be with him. And he's going to show up that night and he's going to say, hey, Gideon, here's the deal. Your family is a mess, all right? Your dad's got an altar to Baal. He's got an Asherah pole. These are idols. I, don't, I cannot stand them. You've got to go clean this up. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to go take your dad's bull. I want you to go break down his altar. I want you to knock down his Asherah pole. I want you to build an altar to me. And then I want you to slaughter that bull and sacrifice it uh, to me. He wants Gideon to go clean up his own house. And for a lot of guys, I know a lot of you here are students listening to this. And I remember being your age. I thought, man, I'm going to change the world. And I got to tell you guys something, that changing the world starts at home. If you can't change your home, if you can't change yourself through God, man, you're never going to get to the point where you can accomplish the big things. And that's exactly what God is going to call him to do. And so Gideon is going to set out. He's going to follow him. But we can still see his heart's not 100% behind this because he's going to go do it at night. Right? Gideon says, yeah, I, I can do this, but I'm still a little bit scared of what people are going to think of me, so I'm going to do it at night. And he does. And we learn a lot about Gideon. One thing is he would make a terrible criminal. All right, because in the morning when the people come and see the mess, they go start gathering evidence. They're like, oh yeah, it's Gideon. Yep, got to be Gideon. And they take off and they go, and they go ahead and go to his father, Joash. And they're like, send him out. Your son tore down our stuff. And Joash, you, you got to hear this. He tore down your stuff and he killed your bull. Like, he wronged us. He wronged you. We're here for blood. Let's do this thing. I want to pause there for a second because Joash does something awesome. And God, dad's here. Like, I need your attention. I know you probably tuned out for a minute here. Like, this is important. Joash does something awesome that I don't think we do enough. He supports his son. He hears that it happens. And he does it in just this awesome way because he doesn't bail him out. He doesn't fight his battle for him. No, he, these guys come to him and he says, no, 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 no. I'm not giving you my son. I have his back. Yeah, he, he, he wronged me. But you know what? I was the one who was really wrong. And I'm not about to give him to you. In fact, it sounds like this battle isn't between you and him. It's really between Baal and him. And I think they should have it out, right? So if Baal is the aggrieved party, if he really has a problem with what Gideon has done, why don't you let him take care of this? And that's exactly what they let it do. They're like, Baal, you can have this. And, of course, nothing happens, right? He could gather up whatever forces he wants. He could bring the, the gingerbread man or the wicked witch of the West, right? Because he's a fairy tale just like them. He doesn't exist. 
God shows Gideon what success looks like when he follows him. And right, he's totally on board at this point. He's, he's just looking great. And, but what we see is this isn't a linear progression, right? Gideon's on his way up. And I think we have this picture of when we're traveling with God, right? We're always going to be going up. We're always going to be getting better. And the truth is, a lot of times along the way, we take a step back. And that's exactly what Gideon does. He sees and hears all this, what God has to say, and he's like, "Mm, you know what, God, I still need some more from you. I'm going to need another sign. In fact, I'm going to need two signs. He says, I'm going to set up this fleece, and I want you to make it dry while the ground's wet, and then I'm going to flip it. I want you to make it wet while the ground's dry. And then I'll believe I can conquer the Midians with you. And God circles back around, and he says, okay, you need me to be patient again. And I can do that. Before we move on to the story, I just want to pause there. Because a lot of times what happens is, is people get to the story of Gideon and they focus really big on this fleece. And what they, you know, we even have this saying that comes out of it. I'm going to put my fleece out. I'm going to test God. I'm going to have this discernment where God's going to have to show me a sign and then I'll know. And, and I think we get this wrong a lot of times. because it, And it comes out of this, this poor understanding how to read and interpret the Bible. Poor hermeneutics. What Gideon does is not good. He once again tests God. And this comes from this thing where we look at the Bible and we say, oh, because it happened, therefore it must be good. It was written about, so it must be good. God didn't do anything bad to it. And instead what we should be doing often is we look at it and say, despite the bad thing that happens, God uses it for good. Despite Gideon lacking faith and trust, God says, I still love you, and I'm still going to be with you, and I'm going to have patience. Finally, God has Gideon's heart, and he's going to set out on his next task, which is prepping Gideon's army, and he's going to go about this in the most unconventional way. See, he has Gideon gather up his forces, and they're ready up against the Midianites, and they look out, and they see uh, the Midianites, 135,000 men strong. And the Israelites, 32,000. The Israelites are outnumbered about four and a half to one. And God looks at this and he says, this is not good. I got to think Gideon's like, yeah, you're right, this is not good. We're way outnumbered, God, this is not what I was expecting. God says, I got I to gotta change this. See, God was looking at this and said, I'm not really so worried about whether you're going to be victorious because I already got that taken care of. I'm worried about what you think about what happens after this battle, who you look to, because I don't want you looking to yourselves. I want you to know this is only me. And so God's going to... He's going to prep this army in just a way that blows my mind. He says, uh, he doesn't say anything about uh, how he's going to prepare them better. He's not going to train them better or give them better equipment or increase their numbers. He says, here's what I want you to do, Gideon. You got some cowards in your army. And I want you to go, any man that just is not ready for this, anyone whose heart's not behind this, get rid of them. I got no use for them. Gideon says, okay. And he goes and tells his army. And 22,000 men get up to leave. He's left with 10,000 men. He started out outnumbered four and a half to one. Now he's outnumbered about 13 and a half to one. All right. And God again looks at this and says, this is not good. (laughs) Yeah, I know that, God, right? This is worse. And God says, no, I can't. This is not not what we're going to do. Here's what I need you to do, Gideon. I need you to take your men, and I need you to take them down by the river. And I want you to have them drink from the river, and I want you to watch how they drink. Because some of the men, they're going to get down on their hands and knees. They're going to drink directly from the water. But some of them, they're going to cup that water, and they're going to lap at it like a dog. And those, those are your warriors. So Gideon has his army do just that. And he has 300 men who lap the water like dogs. God says, send everybody else home. I got who we're going to go to battle with. Gideon starts out outnumbered four and a half to one, and now he is outnumbered 450 to one. Like, this battle seems impossible, right? By themselves, right? They, they got the trump card. They got God in their back pocket. But it, Gideon's got to be thinking, ooh, this is a tough task, God. See, what God was trying to do is prep his army in a way. He wasn't so comp- concerned about their warfare ability. He was really concerned about their army's faith ability. 
said, I'm not really worried how great a warrior you are. I just want you to trust me. I want you to follow me because I, I have this. It doesn't really matter what you're capable of. I can conquer this army. And that night Gideon and one of his servants, they go down and they go to scout out the army and they hear what the army is, is dealing with. So they have a dream and they're like, oh man, we see how Gideon is coming to crush us. There's a little bit of unease in this army. And so God reveals his plan to the Israelites. He says, here's what you're going to do. You're going to take a jar with fire in it. You're going to take a horn and you're going to divide it into three groups and you're going to go up on the hillside around them and you're going to blow your trumpet and you're going to break the jar and you're going to have flames and then we're going to go to battle. I want you to catch in there. At no point does he say, grab your swords, right? This is not how you're going to lead men into battle normally. Like, I don't know much about warfare. I was never in the army or the military. I don't know anything, but I'm generally pretty sure if you're going to battle, you're taking your weapons, right? And yet, God doesn't, isn't concerned with any of that. And so they go up on the hillside, and they smash their jars, and they shout out a sword for Gideon and a sword for the Lord. And the army goes nuts. The Midianites look up and they are terrified. They think there's this massive army come to crush them and they freak out and there's massive confusion and they start just hacking at whatever's in their way. And the Midianites start cutting each other down. The Israelites haven't lifted a finger. And after this, there's this long chase through the countryside where Gideon and his 300 men go and conquer the entirety of the Midianites. God is going to go ahead and prove his point that it doesn't have anything to do with how many men he has. It has everything to do with him. And as a result, the nation of Israel looks back to God. We look at the story and I think it's an amazing miracle, right? The greatest underdog story of all time. And when we look at the end, it's, it's awesome, but I think sometimes there's a problem. We focus right on the end, the end product. God took Gideon, he made him this awesome leader, and, and Gideon conquered the Midianites, outnumbered 450 to 1. And we focus on the end point, and we're like, ooh, I'm not looking so good next to Gideon. And we think, I could never accomplish that. God could never use me. And when we focus on the end point, what we do is we miss the whole journey that leads to this. We miss how Gideon starts out as a terrified guy hiding in a wine press. And God transforms him to become this leader of his army. I know I am often guilty of that. I look at people who God is using, I think, man, I could never be that person. I think that quite frequently. I think a lot of us struggle with that. I think if you're just even looking at me speaking today and you're thinking, man, I could never get up there and Drew, do what Drew was doing. He's got it all together. And what you would do is you would miss this long journey of God transforming me because I got to tell you, I would never suspect that I'd be up here because you would miss the story of how I was a kid and I, I had some messed up teeth. I had a bridge put in my mouth, and uh, it would cut my tongue up. So what I learned to do was talk without moving my tongue. And so every time I spoke, I would just mumble. So I got to this point where I would never, ever talk in front of a group. And if you just looked at the day, you would miss back then how, how uh, I would have these great youth leaders. And they said, man, Drew, you're a leader. you got something special. You're going to do something amazing for God. And I said, a leader? I'm anything but that. No, thank you. I can't be that. If you look at today, you look back at a guy in college who, who, who struggled with uh, concussions. I played hockey and wrestled, and I just racked up concussions, and I got to this point where even today I struggle with it. Like Sometimes in conversations, I just can't find the word. Like, I can picture it. I, I can't even put together a simple sentence. And I just get so embarrassed. I feel like such a fool, and I, I just shy away from conversations. And I walk away sometimes and I just feel God saying, man, you had something really big to offer them. Stop worrying about yourself. If you looked at today, you'd miss the month and a half ago where Will came to me and said, hey, we'd really like you to speak on Gideon. And all I could think of is me. You know, you guys, we, we got some good speakers. We got you, Will, we got Paul, we got Jason, we got Craig. Like, we got plenty of people. Why would you look to me to speak? I don't have much to offer. 
The danger is when we look at the end point, we miss how God has transformed people. And when we look at the end point, we look how God is working to transform us in the moment to accomplish whatever he has call, whatever calling he has for us. And that's what I want to lead you, leave you guys with is this question, this discussion. So wherever you're at, whether you're at church, whether you're at home, in a fellowship group, wherever you're with, take a moment and discuss this. Where do you need to focus less on yourself and more on God? Because I often find that's true for me. I look at all those things of how I can't speak and think, yeah, I probably can't do that. And I forget that God's with me and God has called this to me. And if he's called this to me, he has it figured out, right? So please spend a moment discussing that. And before I leave you, I want to pray for you guys. Dear Lord, thank you for Gideon. Thank you for a man who thinks he is inadequate and really is inadequate, Lord. But thank you so much that you show us again and again and again throughout Gideon throughout the Bible that despite our inadequacies, you are more than sufficient. That in whatever you're calling us to, Lord, that you have it figured out. Help us to trust you and stop worrying about whether we trust ourselves. Lord, thank you for today. We love you so much in your name. Amen. Thank you guys for joining us. I hope you have a great day.